Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Neogen Fintech Limited Q1 FY25 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in a listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during a conference call, please signal an operator by pressing the star then 0 on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ravi Udesh from Ernst & Young. Thank you and over to you sir. Thank you Steve. Good morning everyone. On behalf of Neogen Fintech Limited, I welcome all of you to the company's Q1 FY25 earnings conference call. You would have already received the quarterly results and the investor presentation which is also available on our filings with the exchange. to discuss the company's business performance we have with us today mr tashwinder singh the ceo and managing director mr abhishek thakkar the chief financial officer and ms trivenika avasti the investor relations officer of neogen fintech before we proceed with this call a disclaimer please do note that anything said on this call during the course of the interaction and in our collaterals which reflect the outlook towards the future or which should be construed as a certain forward looking statement must be viewed in conjunction with the risk the company faces and may not be updated from time to time more details are provided at the end of at the end of the uh, the ceo letter and other filings that can be found on our website <clears throat> www.neogen.com should you have any queries or need any further information at the end of this call you can reach out to us at the email addresses mentioned in the company collaterals with that said i now hand hand over the call to mr tashwinder singh thank you and over to you tash thank you ravi uh, good morning everyone let me start by thanking all of you for joining us this morning i welcome you to the neogen fintech earnings call for q1 fy25 as always for the people who have dialed in for the first time i would like to start by giving a little brief about our company neogen fintech operates on a tech centric platform based model offering banking as a service <coughs> through our subsidiary i serve and we also offer credit solutions for both rural and urban areas in india we employ a partnership led strategy collaborating with local enterprise partners that possess extensive distribution networks these partnerships allow us to leverage the partners infrastructure for cost effective outreach to our targeted customers primarily micro small and medium enterprises the msme once we onboard a partner the iservu banking as a service platform is integrated into the partners customer facing touch points this integration enables these touch points to offer banking payment and financial services to the local clientele by adopting this partner led approach we can effectively extend our services to a large number of smes to each partner we engage with the revenue model primarily revolves around transaction fee for commission earned on every transaction process through our platform or as a monthly annuity kind of technology construct as an npfc uh, neogen the holding company extends its services to msmes by providing credit we facilitate lead generation and provide digital access to credit and other financial services for msmes so our distribution platform mainly neo blue we employ various lending models and generate revenue through either interest income or fees associated with our distribution platform last quarter we added super scan to our fold under our holding of subsidiary neogen.ai super scan is an ocr based ai enabled toolkit solving for kyc related issues in the bfsi industry some of its functionalities include enhancing the digital legibility of physical and archived digital documents increasing increasing ocr accuracy and converting unstructured data to structured input we generate revenue through a subscription based model here let me now get into the developments uh, that are more recent uh, related to uh, the quarter in question
Ladies and gentlemen, we have lost the connection for the management line. Please wait while we reconnect them back. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the management line connected with us. Thank you for patiently holding. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Hi. Sorry, guys, I don't know where I dropped off. Um, would you know? Venika, Abhishek? Okay. Hey, Nash, uh, so uh, you were just about to give us the guidance on how the disclosure formats will be working uh, going okay. forward. Okay. Hey, my apologies. Why I don't know why we dropped off, but let me let me restart. Yeah. So as I was mentioning, that we moved away from our older disclosure formats in a bit to make our communication more streamlined. We have divided our business into clear verticals based on which business vertical they are housed under, and the drivers that will help you uh, understand our business better. So while the lending and distribution business is housed entirely under Neogen, the ICP business has been divided into four verticals which we intend to use for disclosures henceforth. There's the financial inclusion vertical, which all of you are familiar with. It will house the traditional IFQ businesses, which is transaction driven like AEPS, micro ATM, cash out, etc. The next vertical is merchant acquiring. This will house our new digital only products like UPI, prepaid cards, and POS solutions. The next vertical is SaaS, where we will house our agency banking solutions, CRM, and LMS solutions. The revenue model here is subscription based. The last vertical is program management. 
which is this is where we generate income by acting as a TSP or technology service provider. The revenue from sound boxes, for example, will be housed under this vertical. Lastly, Neogen AI will have all its income based on the subscription model. The income from these contracts can either be lumped, staggered, or milestone based depending on the nature of the contract. Moving on to the performance for this quarter, our adjusted EBITDA loss for the quarter is rupees 6.6 .6 crores. The loss expanded on account of two factors. The financial inclusion solution related revenues was muted due to industry dynamics, and the company took some provisioning against the lending. The central elections created significant headwinds for the financial inclusion business for better part of the quarter. While the restriction on DBTs, which is the direct benefit transfers during this period, we saw a decrease in withdrawals in April and May. However, we have witnessed normalization in June and growth in July thereafter. On the ISU front, I'm pleased to report that we have commenced the fulfillment of the Soundbox contract and have delivered more than 50, 35,000 devices across June and July. We expect to have a delivery run rate of about 50 to 60,000 Soundboxes per quarter. As the number of Soundboxes uh, pick up, we should also see commensurate income scaling up. This SaaS income brings stability and predictability to our growth model. In terms of a financial inclusion solution, we have closed some marquee contracts for our DMP business, which is the domestic money transfer business, which will again have the potential to materially scale up transaction volumes, which we've already started seeing July onwards. We have now moved, uh, we have now started to move towards a SaaS based model, which has increasingly become a substantial part of our revenue. Given our performance of this quarter, we expect ISU to close net revenue between 35 to 45 crores by end of 25. The financial inclusion business will continue to grow. However, we expect other businesses to scale up faster. Consequently, we expect 45% of the net revenue of ISU by FI25 will come from the SAS and the program management verticals. Thus, as guided last quarter, we have moved away from operating metrics like GTV and take rates as they do not appropriately reflect uh, the full value of our business. On a consolidated basis, we expect the net revenue to be between 70 to 80 crores for FI25, with NFL and pseudo scan contributing the rest. Coming to our lending and distribution business, FinTech as a sourcing channel has been scaling up for us exponentially. This quarter, we added a new partner, Ninja Cart, and we expect this partnership to start scaling up in Q2. We also have expanded product functionality on Neo Blue to include fixed deposit booking. Additionally, we have 160 financial partners this quarter and has raised a monthly origination throughput of almost 170 crores. I'm also happy to report that our net yields on our lending book have improved to 18%. We expect this yield to be sustainable going forward. Our effective lending scale-up is reflective of our ability to successfully leverage our balance sheet. The year will see us change gears as we intensify capital raising efforts. We are looking to grow our lending business as well as acquiring complementary bolt-on businesses. We are looking at capabilities which can help us expand our product portfolio, expedite go-to-market duration, and expand our geographical presence. We expect our lending book to be levered 1 to 1.5x on a consolidated network basis by FY25 end. As mentioned earlier, we have successfully consummated the acquisition of SuperScan. We have implemented SuperScan in our own proposition, leading to 100% of internal cases volumes now being routed through SuperScan. This has significantly improved the quality of our interactions with our partners on the new platform. We have also secured contracts with some of the top insurance companies. As we start to implement these contracts, this will lead to significant incremental revenues. We are now focused on expanding both our product stack and client base to ensure the commercial success of SuperScan. The strategy was to productize SuperScan, and that's exactly what we're doing. Additionally, we are in advanced talks with some of the large BFSI players for fresh contracts which we will be able to disclose to you as and when these contracts are signed. We have done BOCs with these BFSI players, and there has been demonstrated success on the SuperScan side. The current quarter has presented some challenges, which are transitory in nature. The underlying fundamentals of our businesses remain strong. We are committed to overcoming these short-term challenges and resume our trajectory <laughs> and profitable growth. I will now hand over to Abhishek, our CFO, to take us through the details of Q1, a post which we can take up questions and address all your queries. Thank you, and over to you, Abhishek. Uh, thank you, Patch. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so as usual, before I take you through financials, let me give you some update about our operational metrics. Our finance professional network increased by 15% year on year and stood at 6,044 as of 38 June 2024. We further processed 51,816 loans through our network in Q1 of FY25 and reported an increase of 307% year on year in 8% quarter on quarter. Moving on to the consolidated finances for the quarter, our gross revenue X of device sales was rupees 47 crores in Q1 of FY25 
up 4% year on year and down 1% quarter on quarter. The income from sale of device stood at rupees 3.8 crores. So the gross total income stood at rupees 50.8 crores, up 12% year on year and down 1% quarter on quarter. Our net revenue for Q1 FY25 was rupees 5.7 crores on ISAVU and rupees 5.7 crores in enhanced standalone as well. The adjusted EBITDA, excluding ESOP in Q1 of FY25, is a loss of rupees 6.6 crores compared to the positive EBITDA in Q4 of FY24 and loss of rupees 4.3 crores in Q1 of FY24. The reason for the loss have been discussed by Ash in his speech. ESOP charge for the current quarter was rupees 70 lakh in line with previous quarter. The non-gap PBT stood at negative rupees 9.1 crores in Q4 of this year as against the non-gap PBT of negative 2.3 crores in the previous quarter. The AUM including FLDG given off for loan book exposure strength at rupees 208.5 crores up 78% year on year due to the growth on the book of partnership led approach and addition of new partners. The ECL provisions on loans in Q1 FY25 was rupees 2 crores taking the total provision of 2 rupees 10 crores. We have drawn a total debt of rupees 52.5 crores in NFL on a standalone basis at, at the end of quarter 1 of FY25. Our consolidated cash and cash equivalents stood at 104.5 crores as on 30th June 2024. The total debt in NFL on standalone basis taken for the lending business at the end of Q1 FY25 stood at rupees 52.5 crores. Additionally, we have deployed rupees 10 crores in our subsidiary Neogen AI, of which rupees 8 crores have been paid for the purchase of the Tooltrix Super Scan. So with that, we can now open the floor for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Yash Modi from Ashika Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, Tash and team. Uh, hey, hi, good morning, Yash. Yeah, yeah, good morning, sir. So my first question was respect to the overall EBITDA guidance that we had given last quarter. So like I understand we had yeah. obviously stated that we will be moving away from that GTV disclosure and taking it on a gross level. But we had maintained that we would probably still end up in the ballpark of 40 to 45 crores in terms of EBITDA for FI25. So now with this new guidance, I understand the problems are transitory in nature. Do you think on an overall basis, if I do the math numbers, the EBITDA guidance is being scaled down by the company? So I think 40 to 45, uh, the number is only for ISOVU, not for the company as a whole. Okay. The, the, no, no, I'm saying the EBITDA. On an EBITDA level, we said that uh, when we first given that guidance of 1 lakh GTV, 500, uh, 500 crore gross revenue and 10% EBITDA margins, so 40 to 50 crore EBITDA. So last quarter, obviously that 1 lakh and 500 crore, we changed that to net, uh, to look at it on a net basis, but you were still certain on a consolidated level that we would still be EBITDA positive on a con company level. We would be doing an EBITDA of roughly around between 40, 45 crores of EBITDA. So, so on, on that, if we are looking at the kind of guidance. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I thought you were talking about net revenue. So I think uh, two things, right? <clears throat> if you look at Q4 FI24, we were ne we were uh, break even on EBITDA, right? And uh, I think the plan then was that since the company has broken even, we would then uh, take on the mantle of uh, becoming <clears throat> profitable from Q1 itself. I think Q1 has been surprising and and disappointing for us also because of the entire uh, you know ICL business really taking a huge beating. Because the financial inclusion business, which is which was primarily focused on APS micro ATM industry wide, those revenue, those numbers have come down uh, because there was no DBT in April and May, given the you know moral code of conduct uh, which comes in uh, during elections, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the EBITDA numbers uh, are also being revised downwards. We think we will probably solve for between 20 to 30 crores of EBITDA this year instead of the 45 to 50 crores that we had guided earlier. Right, but again, uh, the the upsides that may potentially come in could be through the incremental contracts we are getting on the SaaS-based business, 
which again I can't predict right now because there is some real okay. conversations with some large banks uh, going on. If some of those contracts can be delivered uh, this year, then we will see that upside. Uh, we'll see some benefit coming because of super scan. So there are some of these moving parts in the business. But if I look at it on a like-to-like -like basis on what we have predicted, you are absolutely right. I think the the EBITDA expectation, given that the first quarter has a negative 6.6, .6, as against an expectation of it being positive. Uh, when we started the quarter, uh, there will be a reduction in the EBITDA target. Got it. Got it. The second question is with respect to the loan book. So you mentioned that in this year you would be probably looking to lever between 1 to 1.5x of your net worth. So if I assume the net worth to be 300 crores, so are we looking at any the loan book between 300 to 400 crores? Is that the ballpark uh, that you're guiding for? Yeah, because we have ended 207. At Q1. Yeah, I think 200. Yeah, two, 207 was the first uh, first quarter number. <clears throat> I think uh, up from about 160, 170 was uh, last last quarter. I think uh, our target for the year this year is what 420 crores, 418 to be exact. That's what we are trying to achieve for this financial year uh, in terms of the loan book. Uh, and I think uh, so far we seem to be on the target for that. I, you know what happens in our business is. Uh, a lot of the loan generation is basis our partnerships, right? Because what we are doing is we are working with partnerships, and I've given you examples of names like Khata Book, etc., where we have very, very deep entrenched partnerships, and we've added Ninja Card as a new partner. So with every partner that comes in, there is a potential to scale up the loan book by 50, 60, 70 crores in a pretty quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, time frame. So that is where uh, the expectation is that we should be able to get to the 400 odd crore number of this financial year. Got it, got it. And in, in terms of, like we mentioned that we've already uh, put in four thirty five thousand devices in the month of June and July. So this revenue of 3 crores that I say, uh, see in terms of sales of devices, should that be assumed to be uh, some portion of the 35,000 devices that came in June or is it like normal course of action that took place before Sir Isa? No, no, this is not counting the sound box revenue. This, third, this three crores is the old set of devices that were delivered. I think uh, only because June was the first month when we started the, the delivery of these solutions, right? And uh, I think if I just break it up in the month of June, we only did about 10,000. And July is when this, this picked up and we did 25,000. I'm just giving you the breakup. So the actual sound box revenue is really not showing in the numbers that you're seeing right now, right? There's a very small portion of that. Q2 is when you will start seeing that, um, you know, the entire delivery coming in. Uh, Q2, we may have a little more than 56 to 60,000 devices, but on a steady state basis, 50 to 60,000 per quarter will go in. Those numbers are not materially there in the first quarter numbers. Got it. So basically, we have around nine quarters of device sales already baked into our numbers because we've got a contract of 5 lakh, the first contract that we officially got, apart from the PO that we might be working with other companies, but right now this 5 lakh, yeah. if I divide by 50, 60,000 quarterly, so 8 to 9 quarters of revenue, and incrementally every quarter you'll see incremental SaaS revenues because as the number of devices increase, that, that is why you're saying that the SaaS revenue are, in the overall piece will increase. Yeah, there are two streams of income here, right? One is obviously the, the actual device deployment, and then the SaaS income, which is a monthly right. income which starts recurring right. every month. So what happens is that this, that, which is also the reason why we were saying that this uh, business will become pretty significant from an ICO view standpoint as these 500,000 devices are deployed. And uh, because the bank that we are working with is a pretty material, uh, you know, PSU bank, it has opened up doors for us with other PSU banks also to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those conversations are pretty good. So uh, we think that uh, while this contract of 500,000 is, over the nine quarter number that you mentioned, right? As the other contracts come in, we will have significant upside coming from there, which is why it is difficult for me to predict what where we will land up because it's contractual, uh, contract based, right? As we get the contracts, we get better visibility of where we land up for the year. Got it. Got it. And in just in terms of scale, scale, if I were to look at you know, AI, so what would be the typical contract size that we would be looking at for this kind of product, like? Is it like, like can this scale up say in the next three, four years to be as big as say an ISO view for you or are we looking at a lower scale? I think uh, Neogen AI, we've got uh, about eight to 10 customers we've already uh, closed our uh, contracts with that. When we bought the company, it was basically a toolkit that we bought, right? And the whole 
idea, if I just take you back a little bit on how we had explained the transaction also was that the conversation started with us looking to deploy this solution in our system. And then we saw value in productizing the solution and taking it to uh, incremental clients. Some clients had already been, uh, uh, you know, brought in before we even acquired the company, but totally we've got about eight or nine customers who are currently using the solution in their network. Contracts could vary anywhere between five to 10 lakhs a year to about a crore a year, right? So some of the larger contracts that we have uh, are going all the way up to a crore a year. Uh, uh, and then there are smaller contracts with smaller institutions that are doing POCs, testing us out, uh, right? So those contracts are smaller. But the beauty is that this, you know, with every institution, there are multiple places where the solution can be relevant. Right, every large institution has multiple departments. Every department does its own evaluation. So we are working with institutions, and we run on a program-based model. Right, that there's a three-month program we are running with someone because they have a specific solution or an ongoing program with someone where that will become an annuity revenue. So I, I don't know. It's difficult for me to say it's going to become as big as uh, ISO. I don't think it will become as big as ISO view, uh, but it will be a good, uh, uh, good sort of toolkit to have uh, in our anvil, and it will be a good profitable business down the line with significant margins because nothing gets shared out here, right? All the money we make, barring the expenses of the eight, nine people that we have uh, who are our AI engineers, uh, everything will sort of flow straight into the bottom line. Got it, got it. I'll, 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 I'll ask more questions. I'll, I'll go in with you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you may press star and one. Participants who wish to ask a question, may press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Nikhil Kumar from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, hi sir, good morning, how are you? Hello. Morning. Yes. Hi. So uh, my question is, if you could throw some more light on what effects election had on the business and why I saw you took a beating, and uh, if 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 any of the impacts are going to be carried forward to the coming quarters as well. Yeah. No. I, it's a good question, right? I I don't think uh, uh, you know that any of those effects are getting carried forward. When I look at the uh, uh, July numbers, right? I think uh, the numbers are pretty much back. In fact, we have an uptick there as well. Just to give you an indication of how bad the impact was, uh, you know, April and May, the uh, the ICW revenues were almost uh, almost 55 to 60 percent of the regular revenues that we land up making, primarily driven by uh, by the lack of uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, benefit transfers. What happens in India is that because our business is largely rural-based, as far as the financial inclusion well, business is concerned, a lot of people, a lot of farmers, etc., they all get monthly income from government through various schemes, right? And uh, there are benefit transfers that were also given. But when the code of conduct came in, uh, all the benefit transfers were basically uh, suspended for the two months. No government could go and give these uh, specific benefit transfers. And therefore, there was a complete drop in terms of the APS and micro ATM volumes. Migrating actually saw a pretty drastic drop uh, in terms of volume across the industry, and therefore the associated revenues related to that also came down. Uh, and and some of the newer contracts that we were still working through, like the sound boxes, were not ready to be delivered at that point in time, so we couldn't get a compensating benefit coming out of that. So April and May basically saw that uh, benefit. There was another uh, another issue that happened, which uh, was again an industry-wide issue, where uh, MPCI has brought in new fraud control methods. So the industry was also dealing with how to how to handle the new fraud control mechanisms? For example, uh, you know the size of transactions has got limited. The number of transactions you can do in the month have got limited. But those haven't impacted us materially. But the industry overall got impacted with, with a little bit of that, just trying to deal with the new regulations that came in. <laughs> so it was very specific to two months. And and like I said, in June the numbers were back. In fact, the numbers were bigger than uh, what we had done the previous quarter. And July they're they're even better. So, so we don't think that uh, problem is going to repeat itself. Uh, it's a once in a you know once in a five year kind of scenario. We, to be fair, we underestimated the impact of that. We didn't think the impact would be so material, but the impact was material. Uh, and you also know that we had been struggling with the UPI business with with some banks, uh, which I had anyway alluded 
uh, I think some teasing troubles on that continued, which again now seem to have stabilized. Uh, but the volumes have to come back, right? When we lost our UPI business, uh, right? Some of the customers also went away because we had a tech, tech, we had an issue, a regulatory issue in some sense in terms of interpretation of regulation. Some of those customers have come back, uh, and we are getting the other customers also back, and that's taking a bit of time. But uh, quite positive with uh, with uh, with June and July numbers. We ended the. Uh, Q4, as I mentioned, on a on a you know just about break even a beta, no reason why we can't have a, a similar or better performance in Q2. In Q2, yeah, I'm talking about Q4. Q4, we were break even a beta, right? I'm not talking yes. about Q4 FI20. No, I'm saying there's no reason that we can not see a better or a similar performance in quarter two as well, right? Compared to quarter four, right? So I'm not yes. comparing the quarter one as an aberration for us. I'm saying we'll be back in our. See, this year is a year of profitability for us. That's our path. So we have to be back on the path of profitability in Q2, right? So Q1 was an aberration, which uh, which which is a fact. Uh, but Q2 will not have any remnants of the Q1 issues. Got it. And sir, one more question. There was a general uh, slowdown in AEPS uh, volumes because of certain things, because of land records, frauds, and all of those, all of those things. So are AEPS uh, numbers? Uh, back to the previous levels, or is there still an issue going on in AEPS volume in, in the country? It's not just for us, but yeah, 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 yeah. Overall, overall AEPS has been muted. Uh, the growth has been muted. The numbers are not coming down, but the growth has been muted. It hasn't been growing. Uh, and why is that? By, like you mentioned, right? There are new fraud control guidelines that have been put in. Uh, MPCI has come in and brought in because of all the issues that happened, the land record stuff that you you mentioned in the industry, right? So these these uh, the growth on the ABS volume has been uh, uh, has I mean it's there. It's not that the growth is not there, but it's muted. Uh, and uh, I think slowly and steadily, as the industry gets used to the new guidelines that MPCI has put in, some new checks and balances have been put in on the processes. So those are, those will take some time to stabilize. I think from our standpoint. Since we don't deal directly with the, you know, our model is, as you know, is more enterprise-led. Uh, so if there are five people who are working on APS. We actually get the cumulative volume of all those five because we provide the infrastructure for them to do APS. So while uh, while the industry volume may go down, as long as we can keep acquiring customers, acquiring new partners, our volumes can actually keep going up. So the industry data has some relevance for us, but as we are acquiring enterprise customers, we can still show growth, which. Otherwise, people who are directly dealing with uh, retailers may see a slowdown. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Best of luck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and. <coughs> The next question is from the line of Yash Modi from Ashika Group. Please go ahead. I, I can't. Yes, are you speaking? I can't hear you. Hello? Abhishek Trivedika, can you hear him? I cannot hear anyone. Not us, even we can't hear him. Operator, can you request uh, yes to uh, or unmute his line and then he can ask the question? Oh, uh, yes, sir, just a second. <laughs> yes, sir, uh, Mr. Yash, could you please uh, speak? Okay. I can can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. So I was just referring to this distribution income distribution through throughput of 170 crores. So uh, now that we have onboarded in the various products in this distribution, how how are we supposed to think about about this distribution fees going forward? Hey, distribution uh, distribution <coughs> is is uh, this is linked to a new blue platform where we've got as you know. In the original business, we had about five and a half thousand chartered accountants that actually work with us. 
they log into the distribution into the neo blue platform and they are able to provide uh, put in loans that their customers need and then we are able to consummate those loans by a multitude of partners that we work with including neogen which could potentially also be a uh, lender in some of these transactions but you know <clears throat> pretty much all the big lenders between bajaj finance to you know lnd finance to data capital etc all of them work with us uh, from that standpoint right i think once every crores is the total volume that comes into the platform the consummation is in the ballpark of 20 to 30 crores that actually gets done and the balance either gets pushed out or you know is is just not <clears throat> appropriate to do that number is moving up quite materially typically we make between 2 to 3% on that so i think we are thinking that on the distribution side on a gross income basis anywhere between <clears throat> 8 to 10 crores of income will come in this year this financial year uh, the comparison to last year was in the ballpark of 4 crores so uh, we think we'll double or a little more than double that income this year uh, from a distribution standpoint of course part of that also then gets shared with our partners uh, and uh, Yeah, but it's a it's a good neat uh, form of income that we are getting uh, in in our line of uh, line of business, and this income comes straight into Neogen. So it's 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 at the Neogen level that we are booking this income. <laughs> and my last question is uh, the uh, the need for this two and half crores of additional provisioning on our loan book. Yeah, I think uh, uh, on the loan book, the provisioning incremental provisioning has basically been taken related to one party. which was an old party where uh, there was a supply chain financing transaction done right uh, there again there have been recovery we have actually reduced our exposure quite materially in that uh, that transaction uh, in the old days that transaction was almost uh, 29 crores has been brought down to almost uh, 8 crores i think i think we've taken some provisioning on that because on a conservative basis we were recommended to take provisioning we are recovering almost about a crore a quarter on that position by itself so that is the only real issue if i look at all the new loans that have been done over the last 18 months i think our loss norms are sitting at less than 1% on on the entire loan book that has been generated over the last 18 months but there are some, some older positions that we are just trying to you know chop away with and so that's what it's really so again it's not symptomatic of a problem it is a uh, old problem that we need to uh, figure out and like i said we are recovering uh, against that position as well but on a conservative basis uh, we decided that we would Want to take uh, provision? Also, what happens is that as the loan book is growing, there will always be a certain amount of ECL. So this this provision includes both the parts, right? One is the specific situation, and uh, the other is uh, uh, the regular ECL that comes in as your loan book keeps growing. Got got all the best. Those are my questions. Thanks, thanks, Yash. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question. You may press star and one. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and one. at the start The next question is a follow-up question. It's from the line of Nikhil Kumar from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks for allowing me to follow. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. Sir, uh, hi. Yes. Uh, I'm just wanted to know uh, this change in the guidance of how much revenue is going to come from lending business and how much revenue is going to come from transactional income. Right. If you could give some more, I mean, uh, I know you've talked about it, uh, and it's, it's just not clear to me that the guidance of how much to come from lending and how much to come from transaction is there any change in that, the revenue mix? No, I think revenue mix will not uh, materially change. I think uh, what we've said is that, uh, and, and the way to look at our business is to start looking at net revenues, as I explained last time as well. Right. Uh, I think the guidance that we've given is that between uh, you know 40 to 45 crores of net revenue will come from ISRV. 
and uh, the balance between 70 to 80 crores that we finally get to will come from the lending business. So they'll pretty much be in the same ballpark, uh, right? About maybe lending will be slightly lower than the ICV business from a uh, from a net revenue basis. On a gross revenue basis, obviously ICV will be significantly higher because uh, the gross revenue is before the the cash out that we do, right? Uh, for the partners. Okay, and. Uh, if we look at this bifurcation of 80 and 50 and guide for 30 EBITDA is which means we are going to spend 100 on expenses but uh, given that all of uh, the tech establishments and ISO view establishments have already been in place since a long time uh, where are we going to spend so, this much of money no, sorry I didn't get the math where did you get the 100 on expenses so you're saying 80 and 50 net revenue and you're saying 30 EBITDA so from there, so as in net, as in have you deducted all the expenses as well, or just the yeah. transactional and cash outs? Just the indirect. So the net revenue is your gross revenue minus your direct expenses. Right. Right. So indirect is. Uh, the, sorry, go ahead. Indirect is. Ha. So indirect is how much then? The indirect expenses part. So uh, Abhishek, why don't you come in? Uh, the overall indirect expenses uh, should be in the uh, 60, 60 crore or 55 to 60 crore range. I forget the exact number. Yes, now. yes, yes. That's how, that, that that's how it is. Yeah. Me, majorly for <coughs> ISAVU and uh, uh, Neogen uh, taking together, it would be somewhere around 55 to 60 crores indirect expenses after the net revenue. Okay. Got. It. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is there is uh, there, there isn't a significant amount of uh, capex etc that you were referring to. I think the like I mentioned, uh, this is the year of monetization, right? The build that we had to do, the basic build is all done. Uh, we need to monetize the build. At the margin, there will always be some incremental new proposition. As I mentioned in my call, we are we've divided the ICV business into multiple verticals. There are new verticals like LMS etc, uh, which were not there earlier on that have all been launched. They have all been built. Uh, so there are incremental product solutions that we are bringing into the market uh, slowly and steadily, but there isn't a significant spend related to these product expenses, which is incremental. So, so that's the reason why you start seeing the economies of scale coming in, and uh, hopefully profitability, you know, comes to us this year. And then from next year onwards, I think we take on a very different path. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vishrut Bhubna, so an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Tarshan team. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, 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 uh, Vishrut. How are you? We're doing well. Hope to stay with you. So just curious, you know, as to the, you know, potential incremental uh, fundraising you're referring to, is that primarily going to be, is the intention to center that around some sort of M&A event where you will say raise more equity capital to maybe stomach a bigger equity transaction, so a bigger transaction, or just want to understand the thinking behind any further dilution? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, firstly, there is a certain equity infusion that is expected this year. Right? We've got the warrants issued last August. <coughs> Only about 20% of those warrants have been subscribed uh, as per the law of the country, right? So the balance, 80% is expected to come in before uh, February of 25, which means this financial year. So that's one equity infusion that will anyway happen in the company, uh, right? Uh, from a capital raising standpoint, there are a there are a multitude of conversations we are having parallelly uh, on on strategic uh, bolt-on acquisitions, right? As they become clear, uh, and depending on what becomes clear at what size, one will need to think through the whole uh, financial closure on how we consummate those transactions. Those might require uh, some incremental equity, uh, and and if that happens, then we will bring it to the market, right? So right now there is no formal approval that we are going to raise incremental equity just yet. Uh, but if one of these conversations, some of these businesses are very interesting businesses, and and uh, you know they are they are reasonable businesses. They are not like SuperScan. SuperScan was a small acquisition. The other businesses could be anywhere in the ballpark of between 50 to you know 150 crore of uh, you know acquisition uh, size, right? Partly to be driven by uh, stocks or partly to be driven by cash. So depending on how these transactions come out, I think the decisions will get taken. Understood. And is there any specific segment or sub-segment or type of company we're targeting that's, or any that we can rule out? Like, for example, are we ruling out like a book value business or anything? Have we hard and fast 
Yeah, we are not looking at book value businesses right now. I think the acquisition conversation. I, I can tell you what we are having right now in terms of conversation, but you know it's a moving target. Right now we are not talking to anyone where there's a book value jump. So I'm not looking to acquire a lending business where we are just acquiring a book. That's not the plan. Uh, the lending business we will grow organically. Uh, but on the tech side, there are some very interesting businesses where people have built either great solutions, great technology, just like a super scan solution, right? Great toolkit, uh, which I think is, what I think is probably one of the best in class in in the in the country. Um, uh, there are other businesses where there could be potentially regulatory arbitrage we could get. They could have some licenses that could be material for our business, uh, and they could be synergistic with either what we do at uh, Iserview or what we do at uh, Neogen or both. So those are the kind of businesses we are looking at, uh, and and uh, we are looking at businesses which are, you know, either profitable or on the verge of profitability. So there is not a significant level of burn that we need to fund, right? I, I'm not a big fan of buying businesses where there's a significant burn. So these are businesses that have already demonstrated the ability to start showing profitability, or we are convinced that they are like a couple of quarters away from profitability. Those are some of the parameters we've set for ourselves as we go around uh, looking at businesses that are interesting for us. And this, uh, this is required uh, sorry, capital word. for growth, but that's not capital to fund their, uh, you know, burn. Understood. And, and just one final question around the potential M&A. Uh, have we sort of made any hard and fast rules about whether we want to buy 100% or potentially take, uh, like, say, 50% stakes? Like how we did an ISO view and then... Uh, Think about that over time. Or yeah, I think we would. Uh, I think I think my my uh, expectation, of course, again, it is very bespoke and depends on the promoters and the entrepreneurs we work with. But I would not be looking at acquiring anything below 51%. That I'm very clear. We're not a private equity fund. We're not looking to just you know spray some money and 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 hope and pray they do a good job and and make money. We would want to be in uh, in in deep engagement with whichever company uh, that we we land up acquiring with with uh, full board control uh, and strategy control. Um, so 51% would be at a minimum, but with a clear path to get to 100. I think we don't want to stay at a, even at a significant majority, we don't want to stay at that level. We want to be very clear about initial position being at least 51, uh, could be 100 as well, and but, but very clear path, pre-agreed path on getting to 100 over a period of time. Good, thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question to the management, you may press star and one. As there are no further questions from the participants, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, the call. Uh, appreciate your taking the time out in the morning. Uh, I think quarter one has been <coughs> uh, disappointing for us as well. Uh, but I think the fundamentals of our business are not getting impacted. These are transitory issues that we faced. Um, and I'm hoping that when we meet again in Q2, we'll have better numbers to share with you. Thank you all. On behalf of Neogen Fintech Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lights. Thank you.